Anthony um, Horowitz wrote some very interesting roles for them, sort of two key people, which were Pierce and Valentine, who were the sort of tent poles within MI5. And he did a very interesting thing with Pierce. He actually carried the only other char character that we've carried from the previous series of Falls War, which is Ellie Hannington. And he's carried her over as an SOE agent who joins MI5. So we've got a little bit of continuity there on how we might evolve the show across into this new war for our audience. I'll come straight to the point. I want you to stay with MI5. I haven't got the requisite capacity for deceit. Precisely. I need someone I can trust. Well, that would be mutual. Point taken. She has dual nationality, uh, which of course helps anybody involved in espionage. Dual nationality, French, English. Mother was French, um, father was English. Um, and she worked as a, as a nurse in the First World War. And then, as I say, joined the SOE, which is Special Operations Executive, which is slightly more the spy that's out on the field, so to speak. And now she's moved on to being uh, a member of MI5. So that's as a result of the SOE folding down at the end of the war. I don't think you're ever really going to feel that you know where or what she is. Um, she's very good at keeping secrets. So she plays the sort of spider in the web, if you like, within MI5. Then we have Valentine, who's played by Tim McMullen, and he's very much the underdog. He's slightly put upon, not sure that he likes foil joining MI5. So a bit of nice conflict there. You left behind quite a ruckus. Our ambassador called into the State Department, the FBI in uproar. They'd rather like you back. Mm. Oh, nice to be wanted. He's a wonderful character, Valentine. He's a great foil for foil, uh, because he is a man that uh, is definitely, you have the feeling that he might be just duplicitous, he might be lying, you never quite know what he believes, who he likes. He's quite a complicated character, I think. Um, he's, on the face of it, he's quite abrasive. Uh, and, you know, he doesn't like joiners, he doesn't like um, uh, the fact that he's being, uh, his boss is, an immediate boss is a woman. Uh, you know, he says this. Uh, he doesn't like um, the fact that uh, the Secret Service is um, employing a lot of people from SOE because he thinks that they're a bit kind of, um, they're not quite up to it. Uh, and he makes absolutely no bones about the fact that he doesn't like foil. And he doesn't like the fact that he's uh, a policeman, you know, retired police from, from Hastings. What's he doing, you know, in this organisation? He doesn't fit in. I, I got some, um, bought some books on... Um, the, you know, uh, the books of spooks, I think one of them was called History of the British Secret Service, and, uh, and I read about, you know, Guy Burgess and Philby, and um, in fact I read Philby's My Secret War, which is very interesting. Um, but I've always quite liked that period, and um, when I was growing up I read lots of books about the war and stuff, so I know a fair bit about it. And then we've got a head of, uh, a deputy head of MI5, uh, Nicholas Jones, who plays Chambers, and uh, Rupert Van Surat, who replaces him to play Sir Alec Myers. In the last few days, three high-ranking Russian defectors, our responsibility and in our safe houses, have been found murdered. As you can see, each one's been garroted in exactly the same manner, typical of an NKVD operation. I've ordered a sweep of the refugee centres. Any Russian we find will be questioned, but more importantly, how exactly did they find those safe houses? If we have another security breach, I need to know. He's new in the job. He's got a naval background and he's been dropped in here because there was a problem with the former deputy head, which he won't get into because he'll give everything away. And um, he's had to take over at pretty short notice. And he has inherited an organisation that is in a state of some turmoil and he's got to put it right. He's very clear thinking, highly intelligent, somewhat ruthless perhaps, and his dilemma is he's charged with defending the nation from bad people, Soviet spies and assassins. And he has to fight a pretty dirty war, as he refers to it, a nasty little war that we find ourselves in. And the problem he has is 
how nasty does he get? He has to win, but in winning, does he make himself as bad as the other side? He has to somehow retain some sense of morality and values, and it's quite difficult for him to do. Strangely enough, I was having lunch just a couple of Sundays ago with a woman who had been in MI5 at exactly this time. And I did ask her questions. I didn't get very many answers, but um, it was just nice to get a flavor. And this woman was very typical, I think, of the sort of person who was operating in MI5 at the time. Very bright, and a woman. And MI5, I think, is always had a lot more women in it than some of the other services, and indeed was the first one to have a woman head. Uh, the relationship between Chambers, who is the top of the heap as far as we're concerned in the first episode, and Pierce, who is his number two, and Valentine, who is her number two, that's, that's, that, those are the three, that, that's where the sort of the gradations are um, for characters. And of course, Foyle comes in and uh, is, is independent of them, really, I suppose you'd say, and uh, upsets them in various ways and, uh, as the story proceeds. Action. Mr. Foyle, I've just had a call from Professor Van Haren. He asked if you might meet him this evening at the University Library after his lecture. What was you saying? I said you'd be there. Michael Kitchen is one of our country's finest actors, you know, and everybody would agree with me on that. And, you know, he's a master, especially of um, film acting. And sometimes I've been watching him thinking, you're not doing anything, you know. Where, and, and, uh, and you see it edited together and you think, my gosh, that really works. You know, he knows, he knows about the editing process and I can see him. And he's a very technically brilliant actor as well as being very emotionally appealing, you know, uh, to watch. And I've learned a lot from him, yeah. I've worked with Michael on uh, Foyle's War and one other film. Um, he's, he's very uh, particular about certain things. Um, he uses the word uh, implausibility quite a lot in the sense that he doesn't want it to be implausible. It has to, it has to work. Um, he uses the word uh, safe quite a lot, which, which in his terms seems to mean there is a possibility that we could play this scene this way and it might lead A, B, C, D, but within this, these possibilities, we're safe. So that, that, comes, that word comes quite a lot. He has grown up with that character. He knows the way he thinks, the, his mannerisms, you know, the way he... Um, speaks and uses the, the the language of foil you know it becomes so sort of a part of the thing that i'm sure when other actors come in even if they're very experienced there's a certain sort of sense of he knows the story he knows where everything's coming from michael kitchen is a wonderful actor to work with because he can do so much by saying so little and that's fantastic for a writer like me to play with well michael kitchen was our first choice of actor um, and uh, what is amazing is that he agreed to do the show, and that's not very often the case in uh, in dramas that we make. Often we, we you know we have first choices who aren't available or have already played a detective or whatever. But he was our first choice, and I think that he's shown that he absolutely is that character of foil, um, you know, almost as he is in real life. Honeysuckle was a, a long time in finding. We had a big audition process for that part. We got it down to about three actresses in the end, and we did several recalls on, uh, on Honeysuckle and a couple of other people. And uh, it was a mutual decision in the end between us and ITV, and we just never looked back. I mean, she's absolutely one of the key people in this show. She's incredibly warm and fun, and she just encapsulates everything of that period. And she's a little bit like that as well in real life as well, just like Michael Kitchen is with Foyle. She's quite similar to that character uh, in the 21st century. So she's great. Oh, it's always a, it's always a huge onset. I love um, the show. Um, you know, I've kind of grown up with Foyle's wife. I was a, but a mere girl of 21 uh, when we did the pilot and now I'm 33. 
with a child, and I married, and um, yes, it, it, means, it means the world to me, this show. I think the most important thing for my character, in terms of her life story, is that she met her man, her husband, Adam Wainwright, whilst, this is in the last series, whilst helping him with um, a dilapidated guest house that had all kinds of, anything that go wrong with it, did. They ran out of money. It all seemed to be going horribly wrong. And then the final thing that happened to them before they got married was that uh, there was a, a major explosion in their guest house. It was blown to smithereens. And he ended up proposing to her in the ashes of this place. They walked home, they saw it explode, and he, just when they'd found everybody was out, he turned to her and he said, look, Sam, you know, I think whatever the new life is going to be, I'd like you to be part of it. Will you marry me? So it was a very romantic sort of climax. So Sam has to find herself a new position. She has to forge her way through life and... She's earning, um, bringing home the bacon, as it were, because her husband, Adam, is <coughs> becoming, hopes to become an MP. He's been thinking what he could do, really. He's an educated guy. I think he, he went to Cambridge. He'd done all this maths stuff at, at Bletchley, but he doesn't really have a role in society anymore now that the war's finished. And um, through Sam, really, he's begun to get quite a feel for the rights of people, you know, and looking after people and making sure that they're, they're being properly catered for in society. So he thinks that being an MP might be a, a good role for him. And again, with Sam's help, he gets himself elected. Um, and uh, really we're seeing, we see this, the emergence of this, this man's belief in a, in a society that tries to help each other as opposed to a sort of more selfish society, I think. And, uh, and he sometimes gets things, you know, he's quite a, an idealist. He's quite a, he's naive in that he's new to politics. So he doesn't, he's not a spin doctor. He's not a sort of suave uh, manipulator. He's, he really speaks from the heart and he believes in what he's talking about. And I think that's why he's an attractive character to play because you really feel like you're, um, you're trying to make things better for other people. When we were looking for somebody to play Adam, we were looking for somebody who would provide a lightness, a realness to uh, the relationship that they have, something that was warm for the audience, because we were concerned that it might all get a little bit cerebral, you know, that these, uh, these people um, who were not quite trusting each other, perhaps, you know, were, were withholding secrets. We wanted a counter to that, and a lot of that has come from, I hope, from um, Sam and Adam. Um, it's, it's been great fun to do so far, and uh, working with Honeysuckle is terrific. We've got a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of sparks flying around. I try and get a kiss in every scene that I do. I think that's important for a young married couple in the 40s, you know.